Good morning. We're glad that you can join us this morning in our morning service, the seventh Sunday of Easter. A couple of announcements to draw your attention to as we start the service this morning. We'd like to remind you that we are still uh, continuing with the 10 days of prayer. And on the 29th of, Feb of May, which is Friday, our prayer focus is going to be on civic leaders with both a morning and evening video message from Bishop David. And also, can I remind you of the Pentecost Sunday, which is Sunday coming, the 31st of May. We're going to have services in our parish, Donna Cloney, with a sermon by Bishop David. Well, I want to remind you again of our designated dialing service, and uh, the number will be on the screen, so we want you to please tell people who cannot use the Facebook or does not have access to YouTube so that they can dial in the number, the number and get our services uh, on, on, on their phone. And we want to help you. So if you need food or prescription being picked up, feel free to call uh, Brian or call me and uh, we will definitely be uh, very, very happy to help you. Even if you need someone to pray with you, please feel free to call the rectory or the curatage. The number will be on the screen. And lastly, can I ask that if you are able, please continue to support the church. And if you would like to support the church, you'll find the link on our website, uh, a link that will take you straight to our donate uh, button. Well, let's start this morning's service as we read from Matthew chapter 25, from verse 31 to 34. The Bible says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you, since the creation of the world. O oh God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Mercifully give us faith to know that as he promised, he abides with us on earth to the end of time, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue in our service as we sing our opening hymn, Give to our God Immortal Praise.
God calls us to live our lives to his glory. Jesus said in his word, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbors as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. But we fail to honor him as we should and to respond to his love for us. Recognizing our guilt and trusting in God's mercy and grace, let us confess our sins together using the words of confession as you will find it on the screen. Almighty God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbor as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbor and to live for your honor and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Merciful Father, we rejoice that you pardon and forgive those who truly repent and trust in your Son. Deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning. And can I add my welcome to you? As George welcomed you this morning, we welcome you uh, as you worship with us here in Donnacloney Parish. Just want to introduce the kids pack this morning. Uh, hopefully you'll find a link on uh, our Facebook page and on our website. Um, please use that. Uh, and the kids pack introduces what we're really studying this morning is the ascension from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 14, where Jesus goes back up into heaven. There are different games, like minute games, where you have to guess how long a minute is with a timer and then sit back down. Have fun playing that one. Uh, there are prayer resources. There's coloring in, puzzle sheets, and a memory verse from John 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life that people know you, the only true God, and that they know Jesus Christ, the one you sent. It's a great verse to learn, that we know that God is the only true God and that Jesus Christ is his son. It's a great resource, so why don't you use it with your family this morning? We also want to encourage you to send videos of your family, whatever age you may be, uh, so that we can show them um, send hello to everybody at the start of our family service. If you can record yourself and send them in to either George or myself by email, that'd be really, really great. And we'll have them edited together, hopefully, and we'll use them at the start of our June family service. Well, we're going to watch a video now called God's Story, Jesus Rescue. God's Story, Jesus Rescue. So part of God's story is about Jesus Rescue, and it begins like this. Remember how God told Adam not to eat from one tree in the Garden of Eden? God said, if you eat its fruit, you're sure to die. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. And that's when death and all the wrong things in the world began. Adam and Eve eventually died. And everyone who disobeys God, which is all of us, deserves the same punishment. But God loves us so much, he decided to rescue us by getting rid of death so we could be close to him forever again. He did it through his son, Jesus. It was a battle of death versus Jesus. And don't worry, kids, Jesus wins. First, Jesus had to meet death, which means he had to become a man and suffer and die like us, even though he had never done anything wrong. He did that. Then, three days after he died, some women who were friends with Jesus went to visit his grave. When they got there, the tomb was wide open and angels were standing nearby. One of them said, He is risen. Right away, the women ran to tell Jesus' other disciples that the angel had said Jesus was alive. 
but their words sounded like nonsense. Imagine telling someone that pigs were flying or a frog had turned into a prince. They probably wouldn't believe you. Those things just don't happen. Anyway, crazy as it sounded, Jesus really was alive. And some people saw him and started to believe it. Like Mary Magdalene. When Mary first saw Jesus, she was crying and didn't recognize him. He said, why are you crying? Mary replied, they've taken my Lord away. Then Jesus said, Mary. When he called her by name, Mary realized it was Jesus. Then Jesus showed up to two men who were headed to a place called Emmaus. They didn't recognize him at first either and started telling him how sad they were about Jesus. They were pretty surprised when they suddenly realized that they were talking to Jesus. After the men understood he was alive, Jesus disappeared from their sight. Immediately, the same men went to find Jesus' other disciples who were meeting in a room. While the men were announcing the good news, Jesus appeared in the room too. His disciples thought he was a ghost, but he wasn't. He showed them his scars and ate with them. They realized it really was Jesus. Jesus would appear to more than 500 people over the next 40 days, so there were plenty of people who knew the truth. Then Jesus went back to heaven by rising into the sky. People watched him until he was hidden by a cloud. Then two men in white appeared and said, Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Since Jesus took the punishment that we deserve, now nothing stands in between us and God. Anybody can become a part of God's family if we choose to believe that Jesus beat death and decide to follow him. Even though we still have to live in this world where we suffer and die, like Jesus did, the best part is, we can follow him and be a part of his story right now. And he's preparing a perfect home for his family to live in forever. And that's the story of Jesus' rescue. So, in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Adam and Eve disobeyed. They had to die. We all do wrong things. We deserve death. God rescued us. Jesus took our punishment. Jesus beat death. He went to heaven. We can be a part of God's family. And all that is a part of God's story. This is going to be amazing. Jesus, the game changer. He turns death to victory. Jesus, the game changer. Serves his way to supremacy. He's God's image. He's God's son. He's ahead. He's number one. He'll amaze ya. He's the savior. Jesus, the game changer. Cause Jesus changed the game Jesus the game changer He turns death to victory Jesus the game changer Saves his way to supremacy He's God's image, he's God's son He's the head, he's number one He'll amaze ya He's the savior Jesus the game changer Justice, sacrifice, change a nation, change a life. History has made it plain. Jesus changed the game. Jesus, the game changer. He turns death to victory. Jesus, the game changer. Saves his way to supremacy. He's God's image. He's God's son. He's the head. He's number one. He'll amaze ya. The church leaders is going to lead us in our prayer, which is part of the uh, 
uh, the 10 days of prayer by David, uh, Bishop David, and uh, the prayer will be closed by Margaret, who leads us in prayer for people in our parish, and then she's going to finish with the Lord's Prayer. Good morning to everyone in the diocese. I've been given the privilege of leading you in prayer. Lord God, as the season of Pentecost approaches, we remember your fire came upon the apostles gathered together in one place. We remember that fire burns inwardly. Lord, please warm the hearts of all your people in this diocese. Kindle the flame of sacred love in every heart. And may we all be consumed by your grace and goodness, truth and holiness. Fire also travels upwardly. Come afresh, Lord, upon every parish. Release worship and adoration. May relationship with the living flame triumph over ritual and routine. And lastly, fire extends outwardly. Lord, just as the flames spread, remind us of the importance of outreach. Forgive us when we become parochial and insular, rather than kingdom-focused and outward-looking. Give us a vision for this island home and much further afield that countless millions will come to know Jesus as Saviour and Lord. Wind of the Spirit, fan the living flame. Lord, send your fire. Amen. Lord, we thank you that in this time, with so much bad news, we're also hearing good news stories about community coming together to support one another. Lord, make us, your people, supernaturally equipped to love our neighbours as we love ourselves. Father God, we give you thanks for every person who's serving our community as a key worker, medical staff and shelf stackers, emergency services and couriers, farmers and postal workers. God, give them your protection, give them energy, give them resilience. And Lord, for those who find themselves unemployed or set aside, we ask you to protect their minds from depression and despair. May the safety net of our society catch them and may they find their sense of identity and worth and purpose in you. Amen. And Lord Jesus, I ask for your blessing on this particular branch of your family, the church the Diocese of Down and Dremore. Mould them and shape them. Empower them to be everything that you are calling them to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we take time today to pray for the churches across the island of Ireland. We pray your strength and wisdom to fill each leader, pastor, and minister. We lift the Diocese of Down and Dremore to you specifically today and ask for blessing and wisdom in every leader and especially for Bishop David and his family at this time. These are precarious times that we're living in and we can no longer lead from our old ways, memories or traditions. We need a fresh imagination to lead our people well and more importantly ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in these days. We pray against COVID-19 and any other thing that would bring sickness and hindrance to the advancement of your kingdom. May your people rise with fresh power. May the Holy Spirit refresh and renew and baptize us all over again. May your church rise out of this pandemic with a fresh confidence and strength in you, renewed and refined. We know that it's not by might, nor is it by strength, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And we thank you that you're building your church and the gates of hell cannot and will not prevail against it. Thank you that according to Ephesians 1, 4, that we've been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, chosen for such a time as this. These things we pray in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you. Father, your Son Jesus, anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power, went about everywhere doing good. He showed care for the needy. He healed the sick. 
curing all kinds of diseases. He delivered those held captive by any sort of bondage. Be with your church. Anoint us with the Holy Spirit and with power. Strengthen us to pursue the mission of Jesus today. Give us caring hearts that we may show compassion to the afflicted. Let us not think of what we lack, but of the good we can do for those who are suffering in mind, heart, soul, or body. Lighten your children's burdens. Be their refuge in trials, their strength in sickness, their comfort in sorrow. May they experience your loving kindness through us. It is where brothers and sisters are united that you give your blessing. May we pursue life's journey together. Join in integrity of faith and unite in the bond of love all those whom one spirit has consecrated. Upon your faithful people of the Church of Down and Remore, who have been fervently united in prayer, animated by holy hope throughout these past weeks, send forth in you your Holy Spirit. May your love be poured into their hearts. May they be one. May we all be one, so that the world may believe. Today we pray for those in our parish who are sick at this time. We pray for Stephen, Sheila and Jonathan. We pray for those who have been bereaved, those whose lives have been broken by tragedy, remembering especially the McCullough family circle, wrestling with grief at this time of isolation. Gracious God, we also thank you for the love in which Faith was conceived and for the love of the home into which she was born. We pray that the love which our parents, John and Alison, have for each other may grow and deepen as a result of this experience. Give us grace in patience and understanding to listen to each other and to help one another in the days to come. Loving Father, you are our refuge and strength, our hope and constant care. Comfort these parents with the knowledge that the child for whom they grieve is now entrusted to your loving embrace. For all those who mourn, wipe every tear from their eyes and mend their broken hearts, that yearning for life, they may find fulfillment in Jesus your Son, whose rising from the dead restores our lives to you and leads us to the life of heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we finish with the Lord's Prayer. Let us all pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Before David comes to read the word of God to us, let us pray. Our prayer before the Bible reading is this. Thank you, Lord, for making yourself known to us and showing us the way of salvation in your Son. Teach us through your word and equip us for every good work for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Acts chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 1. In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, 
which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now we come to the Apostles' Creed. I will not ask you to stand up because I know you are in the comfort of your home. But as you sit down, and if you wish, as you stand up, let us join together to say the Apostles' Creed. And always remember, we talk about the Ascension. Thursday was the Ascension Day. But he ascended into heaven and he seated at right hand. When you get to that point, I want you to reflect on what ascension is all about. I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and heart. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue as we sing the next song, What a Faithful God Have I. Oh, you. 
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask you to speak by the power of your Spirit through your Word and encourage us and help us to understand what the ascension means and what that means practically for us. Lord, we pray that in this Sunday after the ascension day, the seventh day of Easter, that you would reveal your truths deep, deep down in our heart. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're thinking about winning and who will win. Well, it depends on what you're talking about, isn't it? We may have different answers. As much as it pains me to say it, and it does pain me to say it, Liverpool FC have only two games to win and the Premiership are trying to think of how they get back uh, to playing football so that rightfully they win the Premiership. Will COVID-19 win as wave after wave it comes back? As America heads to the polls this November, will Donald Trump win? Well, these opening verses that David read for us from the book of Acts, will they tell us ultimately Jesus wins? Not the premiership or the U.S. election or our health, but wins in terms of global triumph as the supreme king of every single one of us and every single person who lives on this earth. And as we begin to read Acts, you may notice that this is the second volume in a series of two. The account that Luke has written about Jesus, taken together, Luke and Acts, take up about a quarter of the New Testament. That's how important they are. Luke was a medical doctor and a very careful researcher. And he wrote his books about 30 years after Jesus died. He was writing to encourage Christians to go on believing the truth about Jesus and to hold out the truth to those who are not yet believers. So whether you're a Christian or not, These, this two-volume book is for each one of us. And Luke begins this volume, Acts, with a declaration that Jesus will win. Now, at the moment, it doesn't look like that, does it? The church in the West is on the back foot. People are leaving. Maybe you feel like that if you're your only Christian in your family or in your workplace. You know, being on Jesus' side, to be honest, feels like being on the losing side. But that's not ultimately true. Because what Luke is going to do is to combine three truths for us, which are going to show us that Jesus wins, God's King wins. So let's look at his glorious ascension, his global commission, and his guaranteed return. The first point this morning, his glorious ascension. If you've got a Bible in front of you, you'll see that Jesus wants us to know how important the ascension is. Look at verses 1 and 2. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And then in verse 9, Luke tells us how it happens. It says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now, when it says a cloud there, don't think of a dark rain cloud. No, think of the clouds as we were thinking about last Sunday night, as we were thinking of 1 Kings 8. Think of the cloud of the glory of God, that cloud that led God's people through the wilderness, that pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. And now Jesus' ascent into the cloud moves, he's, means that he's moved into the very center of God's glory, to the place where he was before he came to earth to a place where he rightly belongs. This was a glorious ascension, and it took place in history 40 days after his resurrection. Although we have celebrated Ascension Day last Thursday, and although we said most weeks, and we said it this morning, didn't we, in the Apostles' Creed, we don't make much of Jesus' ascension, do we? But we should. Because not only is it historically true, it also has implications for you and me this morning. It's what guarantees that Jesus is God's king over everything. God has granted all dominion, all power, all power, all glory to a man, his son, Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've read or watched The Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien, but peace only comes 
when a man rules on the throne of Gondor. He becomes king of Middle-earth. Only then, the race of men, when they rule once more, is their peace. Let me tell you another story. In 1953, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay were the first men to officially reach the summit of Mount Everest. It took a couple of days for the news to get back, first from a runner uh, down to the foot of the mountain, then to a coded message uh, from James Norris, then a telegram to the British Embassy in Kathmandu. The news of the successful ascent reached London in time to be released on the morning of the 2nd of June, Queen Elizabeth's coronation. So Ascension Day came on the same day as Coronation Day. And what was true in 1953 is supremely true in AD 33. When they ascended, Christ went into the glory of heaven. He was crowned, not just king of one country, but king of kings and lord of lords over all people everywhere for all time. The resurrection proclaims that Jesus lives forever. The ascension proclaims Jesus reigns forever. I wonder, is that what you think of Jesus? Or do you have too, view, too low a view of him? Most of us do. We either line him up beside the great leaders in history, Muhammad, uh, Buddha, Gandhi, Medela, but we need to see the ascension places Jesus in a league entirely on his own. He's not just Jesus the Great. He's Jesus the Only. And maybe as Christians, we live our lives without much reference to Jesus. But you know, one of the greatest privileges of Christianity, both now and in the world to come, is to behold the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so look, the glory of the ascended Jesus, it's a glorious ascension that makes sense of the next point, the global commission. Because if Jesus is reigning as king over all the earth, it follows that his followers must proclaim his reign everywhere at all times. And that's what Jesus is doing here as he sends to the Father. He commissions his disciples to be his witnesses, to proclaim his kingship in the kingdom of God. So before Jesus leaves, he makes provision for the disciples. And let's just see how he does it. Look at verse 2. He takes the apostles, remember, Judas Iscariot isn't there anymore, he's died. He takes the others and he instructs them. Verse 3, he gives them many proofs that he has risen from the dead. Maybe you're, you're watching this morning and you don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Can I encourage you to look at the many proofs that there are in the Bible? Can I encourage you to come on a Christianity Explored course and to study the resurrection for yourself? Don't listen to what others say. You study it yourself. Then in verse 4, Jesus commands the apostles to stay in Jerusalem until they receive the Holy Spirit. And we'll see how that happens next Sunday on Pentecost Sunday. And notice what the Holy Spirit was given for, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what's the reason? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus' apostle will be witnesses to the truth that Jesus is God's King of all people for all time. It will start in Jerusalem, their home city, and then expand out to the very ends of the earth. Think of a stone being thrown into a lake. First of all, there's a splash, and then the ripples go out in circles, don't they? Well, in the book of Acts, Jesus and his kingship are the stone that makes the splash. The ascension is what makes the splash. And then we see the ripples going out first to Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And in so many ways, Acts 1 verse 8 is the key verse in the whole of the Acts. For in chapters 1 to 7, we see the gospel go out to Jerusalem. In chapters 8 to 12, to Judea, and then Samaria, and then chapters 13 to 28, to the ends of the earth. 
And it's clear that the apostles, Jesus' followers, are going to need power to do this. Because in verse 6, they're still confused. Have a little look. Then they gathered around them and asked them, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, there's something right in what they're saying here. Jesus is the king who is able to restore the kingdom of God. But there's an awful lot wrong in what they say. Because they're expecting a political, a a territorial kingdom in a sort of, well, dare I say it, in in a kind of Islamic way. They're thinking of territory, geography. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? But look, the kingdom is not a territorial kingdom. It's a spiritual one. The kingdom of God is not a rule, is a rule, not a place. It's where Jesus is acknowledged as Lord. That's why we Christians aren't land grabbers. We're not looking for physical land here. We're looking for our home. The kingdom of God is spiritual and not territorial. And they're expecting a a national kingdom. They wanted Israel for Israel. But the kingdom of God is not national. It is international. It's no longer tied to the people of Israel. And I love it when our church gathers. And it's brilliant having George with us and his family now because not only do we have Thai and people from Hong Kong, but we have people also from Nigeria. And it's great to see God's kingdom and to hear of God's kingdom grow throughout all the world. Do you know the way? Do you know the place where the church is growing fastest? And this might surprise you. Iran. Iran. At an average rate of 5.2% each year. In 2015, there were 250,000 Christians from Muslim background in Iran. So the kingdom of God is international, not national. And then they're expecting an immediate kingdom. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? The answer is no. Because the kingdom of God is not just a once arrived, that's it. It grows. It grows. It expands as Jesus' followers witness to Jesus to the ends of the earth. You see, Jesus' kingdom is brought in not by war, but by truth. And it's what happens is the Holy Spirit empowers these apostles to grasp this message and to share it. That's what happens. And if you look at the top of Acts 1, this book is sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles. The uh, the apostles acting out this global commission to take this gospel out. The question for us this morning is, will we carry on where others have left off? Will we get about and get on with being Jesus' commissioned witnesses, bringing his message to the ends of the earth? Will we proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations? And it's not just a big tent mission or a specific week and then we can get on with the rest of our lives. Those things have their place. It is witnessing all the time. So we are part of God's plan and God's plan will succeed So through us or through other Christians, God will get the good news about his son Jesus, his king, to the ends of the earth. And that being the case, let me ask another question. I ask it to myself as I ask it to you. Am I on the winning side? You see, if Jesus will win, the big question is, Am I on the winning side? Maybe you don't think about that too much. Maybe you don't think it matters. But it really matters because the ascension of Jesus guarantees the return of Jesus. One day, every single person will see the return of Christ and they will see that he has won. So having seen his glorious ascension and his global commission, we're now going to look at his guaranteed return. There's a lot of talk, or at least there was before COVID-19, about how the church needs to make itself more relevant. And I wonder what you think would be the most relevant thing about Jesus. His teaching, his compassion, his example, his death. 
Those things are important. But actually, the next thing that Jesus is going to do is he's going to come back. That's the next thing in his diary. So given our place in human history, the most relevant thing about Jesus is his return. And we say this most weeks in the Apostles' Creed, don't we? That he will come to judge the living and the dead. But do we believe it? It's what the angel said to the apostles in verse 11. Look at it. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking in the sky? The same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Do you see how the ascension guarantees the return of Christ? Now I can't tell you when it's going to happen. I don't know what day it's going to be. Let me tell you about a little girl who was worried about the return of Christ. She said to her mummy, Mummy, do you believe that Jesus is coming back again? Yes, dear. Do you believe he might come back today? Mm, well, possibly, dear. Could he come back in a few minutes? Well, he might, dear. Well, mummy, will you please brush my hair then? We don't know when it will happen, but we do know it will happen. And when it happens, it will be clear that Jesus wins, that God wins. And the right way for us to be ready for him is not about us combing our hair or smartening ourselves up. The right way to be ready for our Savior and our King is to trust in his finished work, to repent of our sins, and to trust in his work on the cross and buy our lives under his kingship. Final story. The story is told about a horse and a wagon with a little boy in it. It was bolted off down the road and a young man saw this young child in the back of this wagon and raced and risked his life to stop the horse and wagon and finally got it to a halt and saved the little boy. Well, that little boy grew up. He didn't grow up to be a nice guy. He grew up and he was a murderer. And one day he stood before a judge to be sentenced. The lad turned round and recognized the judge as the man who had saved him as a little boy. And so he pleaded for mercy. As you saved me then, save me now. The words from the judge silenced his plea. He said, young man, then I was your savior. Today I am your judge, and I must sentence you to be hanged, for you are guilty. Today, this morning, Jesus Christ, the Savior of all, who put their trust and bow to him, acknowledging their guilt. Today Jesus can say to you, I will forgive you. I will fill you with my spirit. I will be your king, and I will shepherd you. But there will be a day when the Savior will be the judge. And on that day when he returns, it will be clear that he is one. And if we have not humbled ourselves, on that day it will be too late. On that day he will say to those who haven't trusted in him, who haven't bowed to him, who haven't repented, then I was your saviour. Today I am your judge. If you're watching and you're not a Christian, can I thank you for listening so far? But can I also make an appeal? What's stopping you? What's holding you back from trusting in Christ? Not because we need more and more people to come and sit with us in Donna Cloney or Waring's town. No, it's because Jesus Christ is truly glorious. And he really is coming back. He is king. He will win. And there is nothing more important in life than to be on his side. And if we're Christians... 
with a half confidence that we're on the winning side. Let that confidence help you keep on following Jesus this week and every week. Let that confidence fuel your witness to King Jesus. Let's not think that because we are Christians, we can put up our feet. Why not ask someone, a neighbor, a friend, somebody on a phone, why don't you video call someone and ask them to read the Bible with you? Why not invite someone to come on Christianity Explored when we run it again? See, we've been called by Christ and filled with the Spirit so that we can be as witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so on the phone, talk to your friends about Jesus. When you meet now with those five other people you're allowed to meet with outside, talk to them about Jesus. And this matters because this Jesus who was taken up into heaven will come back in the same way those apostles saw him go into heaven. Jesus wins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've shown us Jesus' ascension into heaven. And you've made the apostles eyewitnesses of those things to show us your King, the Lord Jesus Christ, wins. Help us to see his glory, to bow our lives in repentance and faith to your King Jesus. Empower us by your Holy Spirit today to tell the world of that same Christ. May his name pour forth from our mouth in praise. And Lord, we pray that you would prepare each one watching this for his return. May we expect it daily and live in the light of it. For then he'll be both saviour and judge. Lord, this matters so deeply. And so let us have confidence to share Christ with others. And help us to see how much this matters. To see it matters where we are with Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn this morning, Before the Throne of God Above.
Thank you, Brian, for bringing us the word of God. And as we heard from Brian's sermon, Jesus win. We need to be on the winning side. And that is what we are called to be. Let us finish with this prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray that you fill us with your spirit and send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We do hope you can join us in the evening as we continue in our evening praise and we look at that Bible passage in 1 Kings chapter 9. Two ways to live. God bless you.